Okay, welcome to the Seminars at Sea pre-conference webinar. Uh, my name is Frank Salatis, and I will be uh, moderating the session today. Thank you for joining. Uh, we hope that if you have other uh, associates and colleagues that are interested in the Seminars at Sea and these topics, uh, to invite them to come on to the uh, webinar. <clears throat> the, the registration still remains open even during the actual program. Uh, just a couple of uh, brief announcements before we get right into these the speakers. Okay, <clears throat> Seminars in Sea has been around for, I believe, it's uh, 13 years, uh, sailing out of Galveston, Texas, to Cozumel, uh, Mexico. Uh, it was created by A.J. Collier. He's the president of the uh, Clear Lake Galveston PMI chapter. And it's a, uh, a program that's kind of a combination of things. It's uh, education, leadership, and uh, you know, great presentations, uh, an opportunity for the attendees to not only listen and learn from the speakers and presenters, but also to have an opportunity to dialogue and, and add some insight of their own uh, to make this a very interactive type of a program. So it is, as it says, uh, combining education, thought leadership, and insight for project managers with fun networking opportunities and 16 plus PDUs. The, uh, the program will be distributed uh, through a very series of, of from promotional uh, marketing items, uh, including what the topics will be, who the speakers will be, and um, what the PDU breakdown will be. We focus on the PMI talent triangle, so there will be a combination of PDUs associated with technical project management, leadership, and uh, strategic and uh, business management. As it says in the slide here, it is a unique educational experience. Some people refer to it as sort of like edu-vacation or infotainment, that kind of a thing. Uh, we like to stress that uh, it's two full days of seminars, uh, generally from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. on Friday and Sunday, plus the opportunity to have discussions in the evening, informal discussions for additional PDUs. And uh, <clears throat> it's brought to you by the PMI Clearly Galveston chapter and organized by uh, Houston Travel Zone. And you can get more information about the webinar, about these the seminars at sea by contacting Sherry at Sherry at Houston Travel Zone .com. So that is the uh, a quick breakdown. This next slide is the information that is being distributed around to multiple PMI chapters and organizations. And um, <clears throat> What it is, is like I said, it's a collection of speakers on a variety of subjects that appeal to project managers. Uh, the focus is to, to go to a, a little bit higher level of education. Uh, it, it isn't about fundamentals or anything like that. It's really more about uh, professionals and practitioners working in the field of project management and providing with the, the, uh, the attendees with a lot of useful information to help them Im improve their, their um, uh, performance to enhance their careers, to to give them uh, a higher you know a level of, of training and education in the area of project management, and uh, it it also combines a lot of fun and networking too. So it's really a great type of uh, a way to not only get away sort of like a vacation, but at the same time you're going to learn an awful lot, network and meet with new people. Uh, the dates are uh, April 11th. The uh, boarding time for the cruise begins at about 12 noon. And they set sail somewhere around the 4 p.m., uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, time frame. Uh, travel down to Cozumel, Mexico, and then return back to the port roughly at about 8 a.m. on that Monday. Okay, so um, that's the uh, logistics depart in Galveston, Texas, Carnival Cruise. It's the Valor. It's a, it's a nice ship that uh, uh, has an awful lot of things going on from restaurants to activities to uh, entertainment plus a casino and things like that. And, of course, uh, Cozumel, Mexico is a great place to be uh, at that time of year where it usually is pretty nice and warm. And uh, getting to uh, Galveston uh, is easy through Hobby or uh, Houston International Airport. So that's some information. Uh, the PDU information about the program will be provided at the very end of the program today. And uh, with that, what I'm going to do is introduce our first speaker. Uh, she is a veteran of the uh, seminars at sea, Elena M. Hill, PMP. And um, I put up there one of the things that she focuses on called Leading Change, the 
MS Engineer way. So with that, I'm going to ask Elena to uh, provide us with some information about her, her topics and also uh, give you an opportunity to possibly ask some questions of Elena during our session. So Elena, I'm going to now promote you to presenter and you can take over at your convenience and begin the presentation. Thank you, Elena, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, yes, uh, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on your time zone. Um, I'm, as Frank mentioned, I am a veteran of the seminars at sea. It was actually one of the ways that I began to maintain my PDUs. But um, I was always, you know, very involved with the uh, team. I've spoken on the seminars at sea a couple of times as well, um, presenting on um, change leadership, as, as was mentioned in my uh, title there. Uh, just a little bit about me. My background is, um, so I have an engineering background in energy. I'm an energy industry veteran. Um, I've utilized my project management skills for over 20 years, um, became a certified project management professional about uh, 16 years ago, and um, my specialty, if I could name one, um, is process optimization um, and, and talent development. I have a passion for um, helping people develop the talent within their organization and helping individuals develop their own um, talent and career background. Um, and of course, using process optimization to either leverage IT or to just find the most efficient and effective ways of moving forward with that. Um, what I wanted to share was uh, is, is a brief look at the presentation that we're going to have on the seminars at sea. I'm super excited about it. Um, anyone who's attended any of my workshops, uh, some of the feedback I get as well, it's, it's, it's embarrassing sometimes, but to hear someone say, wow, that's the best workshop I've ever attended, or wow, you're mo the most dynamic uh, facilitator I've ever experienced. Um, I love hearing comments like that, but primarily because I know people have walked out um, not only learning some great information that will apply to their careers and help them excel um, as project managers or leaders or whatever uh, industry they're in, but because I know they enjoyed it while they were doing it. And at the end of the day, life's too short for boring training. Um, that is my mantra. I live by that. And that's one of the reasons why I chose this title. So I hope that you all can see my screen okay. And Frank, I think you'll let me know if you cannot. Um, and so the title that the the presentation that I'll be sharing is how do they know? And when I say presentation, it's not a uh, dump. It is a very interactive um, seminar that we'll be working on. Very, you know, have some hands-on activities um, because that is one of the best ways to ensure uh, the the understanding of the material and because it is so applicable both at work and at home. Um, so how did they know? And I want to explore the strategy behind Marvel Studios blockbusters. Now, before anyone who hasn't seen the latest Avengers movie gets nervous and says, oh, no, I haven't really seen Avengers or I'm not really into Avengers, don't worry. That's not a prerequisite. Um, I will certainly go over an overview of that. Um, but you will find that those of us who are Marvel geeks will geek out. So I do encourage you to geek out with us because uh, – what Marvel Studios has done uh, from a project and portfolio management standpoint is exciting, it's unique, and it is so applicable. So let's take a look at what some of that will look like. First of all, the credits for a movie typically run at the end, but I always start with the credits for my lead researchers, and it, it draws a point that I will uh, make further in the presentation. Uh, my husband, Rodney, who's centered in the middle of that picture, our four boys, Malcolm, Marcus, Mason, and Matthew, contributed to this material. It became, uh, when I say it, attending and viewing a Marvel movie the day it came out. You know, you can't wait too long, but watching them the day they came out became something that our family uh, reveled in. It became a really important highlight of our family and, and became a tradition. Um, Malcolm um, really dedicated his life to drawing and one of the things he loved to draw were Marvel characters. So it is a, is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and as you'll hear me say over and over again, when you align your passions with what you do as a leader, those passions show through, and people are um, influenced even more heavily by your material because of the passion that you display. So he was an example of that, and I, I am an example of that when I talk about um, strategy and when I talk about um, how Marvel applies to that. 
So that's just a look at some of the credits. But cue the dramatic intro music as you would have in any great Marvel introduction. So in this session um, that we'll discover, that we'll walk through in the seminar at sea, I'll first talk about an overview of project selection strategy. Um, how does that strategy work? And I'll pause on that point as well. And I know that Frank mentioned he'll describe the PDU um, when we conclude, but I wanted to mention that for, for my particular session, you'll earn two PDUs for strategy. Um, and as you see in the, in the PMI talent triangle, you need a minimum of eight strategy PDUs to, uh, to satisfy the criteria to, re to renew your PMP certification. So you'll earn two of those in the session. And strategy um, is an important subject and one that every project management professional needs to be fully uh, versed in and fully aware of. So we'll start with an overview of project selection strategy. I'll continue on to how to sell your project to management. And I give a hint there, which is ROI, right? That return on investment is um, not just a buzzword, but it is the key indicator to how well uh, your project will continue to succeed in the eyes of management and in the eyes of those uh, within your organization. So it's a key metric to be able to communicate. And then we'll talk about how important stakeholder management is to strategy. Um, those stakeholders being not just management who you were selling your project to, but anyone inside and outside of the organization that may be affected. We know from the PMBOK that your stakeholders are people who are affected, can affect, or perceive that they are affected by your project. So that already broadens the realm and the scope of who our stakeholders are. So let's see, we'll talk together about how that ties to strategy. I've intentionally noted in gray those that I will cover in the seminar at C, and that one that is in black, that's what we're going to cover briefly here on this on this um, webinar. Um, and then I'll continue to talk about what to do when the vision changes because as much as as much as much um, consistency is important and certainty is helpful, we all work in uncertain times. And um, how do we as project managers um, effectively shift our focus and shift our team with us when the vision changes? We'll talk about that. And then, of course, there's a bonus, what to say to the critics. And it may involve some head rolling. It may involve some snappy words. But ultimately, what do you say to the critics of your project who are questioning the success of it? What do you say? So we'll have a bonus at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the session on board. What I want to show, and of course to get you up to speed briefly, I can't talk about the importance of Marvel Studios without at least giving you some insight. So for those of you who are just have maybe seen a commercial and know that Marvel exists, you'll at least understand that the Avengers movie and the Black Panther movie last year were the two of the top grossing movies of all times. This kind of success does not happen by accident, and that is really the point, and that is why I focus on Marvel, because it's no accident, and it's received quite a bit of, um, of media attention, and people are aware of it in their homes. But to do that, there was a strategy put in place, and it was a 10-year strategy. They didn't decide movie by movie. There was a 10-year strategy that was put in place, and it started with Iron Man. It started with Iron Man in 2008, and last year, actually going into this year, ends up being the 10th year. So, But just to show briefly, and we'll, and we'll get a chance to talk about these in more detail, and like I said, the Marvel geeks get to chime in. Those who aren't can ask questions because it's fun. I mean... Who doesn't like a good comic movie? Um, so you, so uh, there was Iron Man, The Incredible Hulk, um, Iron Man 2, which came out be building off of the success of Iron Man, and the Avengers, the first Avengers that came out that really showed uh, this situation or this description of teamwork. Um, and again, so many leadership and project management references come out of each Marvel movie. Um, those of you who have been project managers for any length of time know that you watch and see everything through a prism of project management. So this is just one more example of that. This, uh, what I'm showing in front of you, is just phase one, and it was broken out into three phases because just as we've learned in our own projects, phasing out our projects is one of the most effective ways to communicate milestones, is an effective way to manage our team, to motivate our team, and to moderate our teams along the way of project success. So the Marvel Studios example is just one more example of that. And then, of course, finally in phase one was the introduction of Thor. I always 
say that that was Marvel giving uh, giving the mamas out there a little eye candy after um, having attended four of these movies with their families. Um, but again, it's been a it's a program that appeals to all audiences um, in all ages. And one of the things that they've done from a movie standpoint is that they've managed to keep their content so clean. And that has been something that has really set them apart and has made them unique and has really contributed to their success. So enough about that part of Marvel for right now. Well, you know, in the session we'll talk some more because, like I said, it's a 10-year strategy. This did not happen by accident. But just to briefly show you, this is the part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that Marvel Cinematic Universe is an important term to remember, not just in the context of of Marvel. I mean, it is their word. But when we talk about our projects, when we talk about how they fit into a bigger picture, Iron Man, when Iron Man first came out, people weren't aware that, wow, this is part of a much bigger plan and a much bigger plan that had already been established, had already been uh, drafted out. And um, each time a movie came out, it was revealing more and more about that plan, more and more about that strategy. So we have to do that as well, how our projects are interwoven within our organizations and to know. And so that takes me to um, the part about Marvel's vision and their selection and how they actually chose the uh, projects that they were going to use. How did they decide if it was going to be Thor or if it was going to be Iron Man? Well, first and foremost, they played on a legacy, a base of parent comic book lovers who then wanted to pass that legacy on to their children. So they had done extensive market research, found which ones to be most popular, and um, in our session, I'll even dive into a bit more detail about um, some of the characters and how they play and how we can see how they'll relate to some of our projects. Some, you know, when we talk about the Hulk, it's a big, dis potentially destructive project, potentially disruptive, excuse me, to your organization. Um, but you can see how that can relate and how that can be beneficial. So first and foremost was legacy. Second was appealing to humanity. Um, there was an innate, there's an innate bad need to see the battle between good and evil. And so they knew to play on that. Their villains were super villains. Their good guys were super good guys. Um, so we'll, we'll talk again about the comparison and the contrast and how it ties into our projects. Um, finally, relatability. We Marvel Studios was relaunching a lot of comic material that had been launched in the 50s and 60s, much ahead of its time culturally. But as it still played and was still relevant in 2009, 2010, you can see cross-cultural and multiple and both genders being uh, displayed on screen being uh, one of their um, competitive advantages. And when I say competitive advantages, of course, they're competing against DC Comics and some of the other comic um, or some of the other uh, movie studios that had um, gained success, had garnered success around that time. But that takes us, um, and again, we'll, we'll talk in a bit more detail about um, correlating some of the Marvel Studios um, projects themselves and each movie being a project and the, and the selection of each character being a project parameter. So we'll talk about that in some more detail. But that brings us to um, Kevin Feige, who's the president of Marvel Studios, and what he did in his vision with this 10-year strategy and the risks that he had to take. So um, in, in, in preparing for this and throughout my career, I've understood project selection. I've got an engineering background, so you know, math and long equations Equations don't quite frighten me, but honestly, they're not always applicable. But here's one that I want to present to you that is a project, a project portfolio selection uh, equation that you can look at and you can see it's got sigma, it's got lambda, it's a bit complicated. And if you allow certain people to tell you project selection is complicated, but it is really simplified into a simple statement that the underlying assumption of modern portfolio theory is that decisions are based on a trade-off between return and risk. What it really boils down to as a project leader is understanding the pro how your project uh, will either add to the profitability of your organization, add to the competitive advantage of your organization, and what kind of risks are associated with taking on that project. Is the value of the pro of the investment in that project going to um, balance out and be worth the return that will potentially be undertaken by the organization? 
Kevin Feige saw this very clearly when he became the president of Marvel Studios in 2007 and when he put together this 10-year plan. He had to put up for collateral the rights to Spider-Man. Think about that. He put up the rights to Spider-Man for a $50 million investment that would allow him the collateral to launch his first two movies. The idea there was that if those two movies succeeded, and that was Iron Man and Hulk, if they succeeded, he would have the rights and the, and the capital to move forward. If they failed, he could lose the rights to Spider-Man. It's a pretty big risk, but as the future unfolded and told everyone that was watching that it was a risk worth taking, and because he had done the market research, because he had aligned it to legacy, and aligned it to uh, relatability and aligned it to uh, people's innate need to see good and evil in this day and age, he knew that he had a portfolio that was set up for success. So while you and your organization may not have access to the president, to the CEO, those who are making those executive decisions, as project managers, we have to know what those executive decisions are and to be in alignment with them. Uh, one of the things and one of the reasons for the PMI Talent Triangle is so is to encourage project managers to feed in the right, right information to the C-suite so that the appropriate decisions can be made. So we'll talk about project selection in some more detail, and then we'll go through an exercise talking about project selection within your own organization. So that's what I wanted to leave you with as an overview of what we're going to talk about in our time together. Like I said, you'll earn two PDUs talking about project strategy. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to hear from different project strategy examples from those who are in attendance. Um, I'll have several other case studies, not just Marvel Studios, because while that is the underlying theme, um, I'll have additional research that that um, that underscores the importance of knowing as project managers of knowing what the strategy is so that every decision that you make can align with that strategy. Everything that we want to do is to be in alignment. So I'm super excited. I can't wait. And not only do I love um, project management, but I love cruising. So um, cruising plus project management is a long weekend in heaven as far as I'm concerned. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you all on the cruise um, during the seminars themselves and on board. And when we enjoy some downtime or probably uptime, depending on your personality, um, in Cozumel. So looking forward to having you there. And Frank, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, uh, Elena, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of information here and a lot of things to uh, help people consider to uh, uh, join the cruise. Um, <clears throat> particularly, I, I took some notes during your session, and I think you really um, focus heavily uh, and, and emphasize the importance of that long strategy. You're talking about, a, a, you mentioned a 10-year strategy. Uh, I think many organizations uh, are focusing on a one, three, five-year kind of a strategy. They're moving the uh, business forward. And the, and the reason for that is that when you look out, you know, past three to five years, uh, the, the, the picture gets a little bit fuzzy. But having something that provides direction over a longer period of time, say 10 years, seems to be a a, a very uh, you know smart way to look at things for the future and for the business. I also think that uh, a key some key items that are not necessarily discussed in portfolio management or, or mentioned during your session here, the uh, the legacy part, making sure that you are in connect in connection with your stakeholders uh, through that market research. Uh, also, the humanity. Uh, this is something that, to tell you the truth, when I speak about uh, project management, project portfolio management, don't really talk a lot about the good guys and the bad guys, but uh, that happens to be something that we all have to deal with in project management. And then uh, the other piece, the relatability, the, the culture and the genders, I think that uh, the more mature organizations do have a, a very good, strong understanding of the cultural needs of not only their own company, but of the uh, the various stakeholders and, and customers that they deal with, including genders and so on. So um, we've got a lot of information here. It looks like it's going to be a, a, an exciting session. And um, the other thing I was particularly interested in was the issue of risk, something that people really need to focus a lot on. And um, the trade-off between uh, risk and uh, return 
And in this particular case, the risk uh, that you mentioned was a risk worth taking. Certainly something that we all should think about is making sure that if we do take a risk, that we really gather up as much facts as we can and that we take reasonable risks. So uh, I don't have any specific questions from the audience, but thank you. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, we have uh, satisfied some, some needs, provided a takeaway, and we'll be moving on to our next presenter in just a sec. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, so now as we move forward, it should be on the slide that you see ahead. Uh, Mr. T. Allen Claypool, uh, the president of TAC4 Solutions. So Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, make you a presenter and give you an opportunity to provide some insight on your programs and your presentation. Okay, so you should see a window that says uh, share your screen. And, and with that, I uh, welcome uh, Mr. Allen. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm Alan Claypool from TAC4 Solutions, and we are a consulting firm that largely does financial system implementations. We are the project managers for um, usually big implementations like a general ledger system, budgeting system for um, medium to large size corporations. And so the um, we've had a lot of experience with the, as Elena was talking about the good guys and the bad guys and where all of us like to think of ourselves as the good guy and we like to think of those assassins or people that can um, dive bomb your project as the bad guys and so we're going to um, the presentation on the cruise will be talking about um, project psychological warfare and all of the um, psychology and all of the human aspects that come into play on complex projects. So the majority of our experience is around financial systems. So we're catered just a little bit in the in the conversation to financial systems, but really um, given that we're talking about people and the humanity of those people, um, I hope that it would apply to all projects. I'm looking forward to the cruise. I've never done a, um, a a PDD on the cruise, so that sounds like a very enjoyable experience, and I'm pre I'm glad to be uh, um, invited. Let's see. So, um, let's define project assassins. What I mean by that is specifically the people who can take your project and just cancel it if they so choose. So there is. Um, let me. Sorry, I've got something in the way on my screen. I'm going to get rid of here. There we go. Hope that's better. Um, so assassins, and I actually have had um, about two in my entire career. I've been doing financial systems projects for about 20 years. And on one or two of those projects, one in particular and sort of a second one, we've had an assassin that came in and literally shut down the project and we were sent home the next day um, because the, the managers of the project were not properly um, communicating with these, uh, and I'm calling them assassins, and we're going to see in a minute that um, all of us can be good guys and all of us can be bad guys, that specifically the assassins are um, people that can shut down your project because they don't agree with the um, either they don't agree with the strategy of the project, they don't agree with the benefits of the project, or they also may just have other concerns that are valid on the project. These, these people are not usually people that are just bad people. I'm not saying that there aren't bad people. I'm saying that usually um, the people that I've encountered that would be tempted to shut down a project, um, it's easy to think of them as bad people, but in reality, they are just people that have valid concerns that have not been addressed. And so from my perspective, if they really do have valid concerns, if I as a project manager am not caring about those valid concerns that they have, then it makes sense for the assassin to do something about it to meet those concerns. And so what we're going to look at during this pro during this presentation is how what is all of the humanity that's going on inside the head of a of what we're calling the assassins or what's going on inside of the head of me and all of the other stakeholders that starts us getting at war with each other. And is there something we can do instead to intercept this assassin before they dive bomb, the, dive bomb the project? Is there something we can do that brings them in and converts them to an actual advocate of the project? 
So really, people are the hardest part of a project. I do financial systems projects, and there is a lot of complexity in a financial systems project, just with things like getting out the business requirements, getting all of the different people throughout the organization to talk to each other. This is a very hard thing to do just from a technical perspective. But what I have found is that really people are the hardest part of the project. And by people, I mean myself. I am just as complicated as the guy across the table. And really, it's that we all have an ego. Parts of that ego are good. Parts of that ego have negative aspects to them. And it's dealing with that ego. I mean, honestly, I'm just amazed that projects can work at all because just dealing with my own ego, the good and the bad and all the intricacies inside of just myself. I'm, I'm, if you think about the humanity that's going on with our amygdala and with all the different um, history that we have inside of ourselves, it's truly amazing that we can even just get out of bed in the morning and like walk to work. That's just amazing to me. Then if you put two people with all of these ego things together, nonetheless, 20 people or 100 people that might be involved in a project, it's just a miracle that we can get anything done at all. Because inside of our ego, we have we are bringing a lot of things to the table. We're bringing our worldview, the things we care about, our core values, our history. I mean, think how much history we have. I'm 50 plus years old. I've got a lot of history. So do you. We all have different education. Some things the same, some things different. Um, The way I think of myself, my identity, different skills, different fears, all of that complexity that's sort of fighting with inside of myself. They're all fighting with each other, trying to become something that gels into a person. Um, It's just really amazing that projects work at all, that people can do anything together. And so what we're going to look at a lot during this presentation is the aspects of my ego that tend to play out. What behaviors do I have? Do I exhibit just because I'm a human that make me either good to deal with or sometimes difficult to deal with. And these um, aspects, these behaviors are really traits that I think innately most of us innately have have all the time. It doesn't mean that we always exhibit it this way. Maybe we've become more mature or learned how to emotionally relate to people better, but the innate reaction that's initially inside of us are these next behaviors we're going to look at. We all tend to think of ourselves first. It doesn't mean that we are totally selfish. It just means that I'm inside my own head. I'm not inside your head. And so by nature, the first person that I would think of is me. I can train myself to care about your needs, to start thinking about what you, the way you see the world, but that's trained behavior. Innately, I think of myself first. Most people do as well. Also, most people think that they are right about almost everything. We think that we are right. And it doesn't mean that we are right, but boy, when I have an idea, a suggestion for how something works, uh, um, maybe I have a, um, I've done some root cause analysis and I know the reason that something's not working the way it's supposed to work. I can stand on top of a high pedestal and say, I know I'm right about this. And that's the way most of us naturally react whenever we're faced with the problem. And so it's learning how to fight some of these, how to struggle with some of these egos within these natures of our ego within ourselves that can make us work really well together or really badly together. Also, I hear what I want to hear. And my word, have I been told that this is one of my um, downfalls? I was in a meeting with the CEO of the client that I'm at about a month ago, and there were about four of us in the room. And when we walked out of the room, I said, okay, great. So we're going to hire this person. And everybody else in the room said, what do you mean we're going to hire? He didn't say that at all. He said, maybe under these certain circumstances. And I said, that's not what I heard at all. And consistently in the room, everyone except for me heard the exact same thing. And I was the one who was the outlier. I heard what I wanted to hear. I was excited about it. And it's just a natural thing that most of us do. We hear what we want to hear. And that creates a lot of confusion on projects. We don't necessarily know what what reality is. And so we've got some tools that we're going to learn in this session um, that help us counteract these natural parts of our ego. And I'm just going to quickly go over the rest of them in the interest of time. During the presentation, we're going to go over these in detail. We'll have some interaction about them 
in general, people want to be respected. In general, people get defensive when they're challenged. Actually, I've seen sort of two different ways this plays out. Most people get defensive when challenged. Some people, because they don't want to be defensive, they avoid conflict altogether. And other people are just aggressive all the time. And and there's so there's different ways that we face conflict. And all of that's part of our ego, part of our history, part of the, the our family environment, the way we grew up. I grew up in a passive aggressive home. And so therefore, um, I tended to avoid conflict until I became a project manager that realized that conflict can be good. And it's an, it's an absolute essential part of every project. So we're going to learn some project management tools that we can do to really work um, to get our ego, the good parts of our ego pulled out from all project members and the more negative parts of our ego, um, some tools that we can use to actually struggle against those so that they don't impact the project negatively. In general, people lack personal responsibility. And what we mean by that is if I'm complaining about something, then I'm not actually doing anything to make it better. I'm waiting for you to go make it better or, or I'm waiting for the weather to get better in order for me to, for my life to get better. When personal responsibility would say there is something that I can do about my own frustrations to make them better. Also, people like to talk behind each other's backs. It's just a natural way that we build allies against our enemies um, and and that is so dangerous in a project, and yet it's also so innately core to our ego, to the way we were before civilization really got built with that fight or flight response um, with, hey, well, let's gang together in order to protect ourselves. And again, very detrimental to a project. And there are very specific tools that we use on projects to counteract that ego so that we are working well together. People want to feel useful and pur purposeful. They want to be included in decisions. They want to please other people. They want to be effective. All of these are aspects of our ego that if you can remember that much of a project is as much about the psychology of the people as it is about getting the tasks on the project done, then, then we can change the way we manage projects to constantly cater to the good aspects of each other's ego and to counteract those negative aspects of each other's ego in order to make a cohesive team. And so what really the, the, pro, the, thrust of this presentation is about is how to build the impossible, which is a cohesive team. I call it the impossible because if you think about my own ego and how I can barely get out of bed in the morning and wow, how could we possibly be working well together? Um, it feels like an impossible task. And yet we have successfully done built cohesive teams over and over again by catering to the ego of each person and recognizing how to build this cohesive team together. So in the presentation, we're going to learn 12 different tools that do consider each member's ego along the way of a project that effectively builds a cohesive team every single time. And, and just so you know, I'm, I'm on a project right now that's at a client. There's another sort of side project um, that was started maybe six months before our project. And our team is shockingly cohesive, moves in the same direction. Everybody's on board with every decision. And the other project, it's not that they're bad people. It's not that they're bad project managers, but they've, they neglected this cohesive team aspect and they're struggling as a project. Every single decision, the team members are sort of fighting with each other and not moving in the same direction. It's very, very doable to build a cohesive team and the impact of having one is dramatic with everybody. There's a, there's a definite advantage to everybody moving in the same direction. And then the other thing that we will look at is how then, because of this psychology, because of this looking at the ego of all people, how can you convert would-be assassins into project advocates? And so we'll, we're going to look at 12 steps. And just to wrap up this presentation, I'm going to give a teaser for just one of those um, 12 steps, which is interviewing all stakeholders. And by all, I mean, you know, sometimes stakeholders include people that are like, you know, outside of your corporation, they may be um, customers or government, and maybe it's sometimes hard to get to all of all customer, all stakeholders, but we highly recommend 
interviewing as many people as possible. Err toward interviewing too many people before the project ever gets going. Why? Because you're tying into that ego of everybody wants to be respected, wants to feel heard. Everyone wants to be included in decisions. And so if you think somebody might have an interest in the project or the project's outcomes, go interview them. It gets them included. It helps build that buy-in. Um, also, allow for confidentiality during the interview. And here you're sort of playing into a negative aspect, which is that people want to talk behind other people's backs. I will say that during the interview is the only time on our projects that we allow any talking behind people's backs. And that's for two, two reasons. One, we allow it because we do need to get as accurate a lay of the land as possible. And so during confidentiality, people will say things that they otherwise wouldn't say and also make sure you really keep that confidentiality. Um, so, um, but also because we haven't yet taught people the tools of how to not talk behind people's backs, which we do early on in the project, but it's usually right after the interviews. So that helps us get as much information as possible. It helps build a bond between us and them. That confidentiality makes a big difference in the interviews. During the interviews, you ask good questions such as what is working well currently, what is not working well, what do you want from the new system, what do you fear from the new system, and you you ask really good questions that bring out anything that they want to tell you related to the project. Also, oh, and why do you do that? Because you're tying into that known ego trait that everybody thinks they're right. And so when you're asking what's not working well, what is working well, they're just going to tell you the way they see it. And they'll tell you with great confidence that this is the way you the, the world is. You might hear from another person how drastically different it is, but at least you're getting as a picture as possible from each person and you're tying into that ego trait that they think they are always right. Um, just as a side note, we take great notes during the interviews, like literally trying to write down just about every word they say. And then the most important part is that we go through a post interview process after each interview for about 30 minutes, we read through the notes and pull out any relevant comments that can go into artifacts such as business requirements, uh, risks, project charter, anything that would go into those artifacts. At the, at, if we do this and do it well, then after the entire interview process, we basically have the entire business requirements log finished. I mean, it's it's we've probably captured 90 plus percent of the business requirements just by talking to the interview folks and then pulling their, the notes from those interviews into these um, project artifacts. It's, it's such a great way to get a thorough project charter right up front with having, without having to reinvent the wheel, without having to just remember vaguely what everybody says. Instead, you're getting very accurate words into those business, business requirements and project charters. So this is one of the tools that we use to tie into that ego of each person and make sure that we can build a cohesive team, make sure that people do feel included, that their ego, their psychology, their, their amygdala, all of that stuff is like working toward the benefit of the project instead of getting, um, getting festered and to where people can become a project assassin. So doing things like this cuts them off before they would ever get there and makes them feel that humanity that, hey, we as project managers understand that they are a human who deserves our respect and honor and is going to include them as best as possible on everything in the project. So I very much look forward to giving this presentation. It, it is fairly interactive on the cruise, and I hope we have a good crowd. Alan, thank you very much. You. A lot of uh, really uh, useful information there. I had a, uh, <clears throat> a question. Well, actually, uh, there are a lot of questions, but one of the things that I um, came up with uh, was, you know, I, I do a presentation uh, talk, uh, that really focuses on uh, managing difficult stakeholders and uh, I, I never actually included a, uh, a category or, or subtitle called the Project Assassin. And I think that uh, just about every project manager uh, might experience uh, someone that is, is kind of not very happy you with either the way you're running the project, the, the, the way the project is moving forward, 
uh, maybe they have another project that they felt would be more important than your project, but there's a lot of things that, that actually go on there that uh, require uh, project managers to take into consideration. And certainly ego, you mentioned ego as being a key part. Um, I, I recently experienced something uh, along the lines, and I guess maybe you'll be speaking about that uh, during the seminar, uh, that people actually tend not to provide what I would call face-to-face -face, uh, feedback that might seem uh, critical, that they would rather find a more a passive way in, in which to do that so that they, instead of actually confronting an issue saying, you know, I'm not really happy with this at all and here's why, they tend to sit back in silence and then later on complain to somebody else. Uh, is that your experience? Um, it is my experience that that's how humanity is, but it is not my experience on our projects for several reasons. First of all, um, during the interviews, we it's not just, hey, address a confidentiality, but we build trust with people very quickly. We've got several techniques that um, let people understand that we are genuine, that we are for them, and that we desperately want their reality out out and known on this project. And so when we say, when we have these interviews, we usually get people just gushing. I mean, they just tell us everything. We've got good questions that we ask and they tell us everything. And so certainly from the interviews, we don't usually have that problem. But also throughout the project, one of the first things we do, and you'll hear this on our, um, on the cruise, one of the first things we do is we identify the core team, we interview everybody, and then we not just we don't interview just the core team, we interview all stakeholders, and then we, we take the core team on a retreat, and it's usually a three or four day retreat where the biggest thing we are doing is building a cohesive team and telling them these are behaviors, how we're going to act on this project. You are going to be vulnerable. If you are thinking something, you're going to say it. We've got a set of nine ground rules that we use and they tie in very nicely, by the way, with Joe Luttrell's um, presentation that he's gonna talk about as well. I think he's the next presenter. And, and it's how do you get people behaving in ways that add benefit to the project and build trust with each other. And so on our project, the core, the core team is usually incredibly bonded with each other. And we don't tend to have that um, you know, lack of forthcoming um, that I have seen on many other projects. Okay, well, looking forward to hearing more about that. And I'm sure everybody else is. So right now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Joseph Luttrell from EQ Seminars, and uh, Joseph, uh, we welcome you and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about uh, your topic and, and also uh, uh, getting people ready for the uh, seminars at sea. So this is uh, Joseph Luttrell. Okay, want to make sure that we can hear Joseph. So you, you should be on Joseph and ready to go. Okay. Um, can everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my name is Joe Luttrell, and I'm the president of Historic with an EQ uh, Leadership Seminars. The seminar, workshop, and book uh, deliver an easy-to-understand set of neuroscience-based principles that you can use to view high-caliber leadership development in action and develop your own personal action plan. Uh, to fully unlock your own cognitive leadership genius. Uh, this, uh, this seminar does seem to play off of Elena and Alan's uh, hero and villain theme, and uh, you'll find out quite a bit more about that. Um, I don't know about you, but I uh, started learning about emotional intelligence maybe 10, 12 years ago, and it's a topic that keeps threatening to deliver something, but then it seems like you never really uh, get anything very practical back out of it. Uh, so we conducted quite a bit of studies and uh, done quite a few workshops uh, to distill down uh, the best of everything that's out there in terms of um, the emotional intelligence and also a study uh, called the Adverse Childhood Events Study. And uh, so we boiled down a set of principles that um, apply. Uh, they essentially describe uh, leadership development and how leaders uh, become great. And so they focused in on uh, the 
relationship, as Alan was alluding to earlier, between the two parts of the brain, the amygdala and the frontal cortex. And they basically, our egos kind of flow from the fact that we have a pretty dysfunctional relationship between the communications between our amygdala and our frontal cortex. Uh, the, the amygdala is sometimes called our lizard brain, and it acts as a storehouse for our most unpleasant memories. Uh, particularly the ones that occur during our formative adolescent years. Uh, the amygdala sends an alarm to our frontal cortex, which is our higher thinking part of our brain. And if the frontal cortex hears the alarm saying that there's this dangerous situation and the frontal cortex goes, no, we're okay, uh, then that's the way that it's supposed to work. Uh, but all of anxiety seems to be driven by the fact that the amygdala will send an alarm that the frontal cortex is not scripted to hear. When that happens, uh, the amygdala, which is in charge of the adrenal glands and all of these other uh, high energy biochemical uh, producing organs, um, it turns all of that loose on us. And not only is that not bad enough, but it also takes control of our thought processes from our frontal cortex. And again, just to reiterate, the frontal cortex is the smarter, much smarter of the two, and uh, the amygdala is, is not. Um, so obviously thinking from such a limited part of your brain uh, compromises your decision making, it drives anxiety, and it limits your ability to lead in times of high adversity. So this seminar employs, employs neuroscience to use these biochemically loaded emotional reactions to isolate the gaps in your frontal cortex. And after, the, after you identify these, then you can shore these up. And as a leader, you can remain in executive control even in the midst of adversity and crisis like the world-renowned leaders that we've come to know. Uh, these principles are framed across three observable life stages. Uh, the first is uh, familiarization, and we'll go into more depth with the principles that are associated with that. Uh, but that is essentially when you're having these uh, high anxiety moments, uh, you don't just weather them and get through them. You start to take note of those. You start to monitor those. Uh, then you can move on to rescripting in terms of uh, shoring up the gaps in your frontal cortex. And then subordination means your frontal cortex is in charge 100% of the time. The amygdala doesn't, doesn't take over. Um, <clears throat> so. That is all of emotional intelligence distilled down to one slide. And so what we did is that we have studied uh, a whole lot of great leaders, uh, but we boiled it down to three leaders that read, led during revolutionary times and were able to produce some pretty lasting results. And uh, so that's Washington, Lincoln, and Churchill. Now on the cruise, uh, you might get to interact directly with Washington, Lincoln, and Churchill, and they will probably ask you to tell you some of your leadership stories and experiences, so you can see that you're already doing a lot of these things, and it's just a matter of, of turning them into recognizable habits, and then you'll get to get to hear their stories as well. Uh, in addition to these three gentlemen, for this cruise, um, we might also hear from Dolly Madison, Susan B. Anthony, and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, just because we have a little bit more time on this particular cruise. Uh, we start off with George Washington, and he helps us understand the uh, ego familiarization principles. And George Washington, when he was 22 years old, um, made a pretty big mistake. He was a uh, uh, in the um, French uh, he was in the British provincial military, and uh, he was sent on a diplomatic mission. Uh, and instead of delivering the diplomatic message, he actually attacked a band of Frenchmen and killed about half of them. And then also uh, one of his uh, scouts uh, killed a key diplomat. And he uh, it was an all-out ambush assault. It didn't really make a lot of sense to anyone. And you may, have, you may think that this is part of the uh, French and Indian War. It wasn't. It's actually what ignited the French and Indian War because uh, the British weren't at war with the French. And this blunder led to quite a bit of shame and ridicule on the world stage for Washington. And then also uh, he was facing demotion. 
So it's in these types of moments that leaders either derail and take the path of like a Napoleon. Uh, they blame others. Um, they blame the circumstances. They do anything but say, what did I do wrong here? And so this is where we start to encapsulate some of these emotionally accountable uh, principles so that they can be repeated and practiced and get better at them. And so the first one is uh, don't rely on avoidance behaviors to escape the pain of loaded emotional reactions. Uh, loaded emotional reactions are very painful. Uh, it's very embarrassing. And they are very amplified because what's coming from the amygdala. So the first thing is don't avoid those. Start monitoring for those. And then the second thing is to start to take an account as in a ledger of loaded emotional reactions so you can see kind of what your trigger points are and get to understand your own ego a little bit better. And so we take this um, uh, journey with Washington and we explain how that he followed up in terms of the blunder that he had there in the Ohio Territory. Uh, but before we do that, we do a Mad Men flashback into his adolescence and talk about some of the insecurities that he was grappling with. Uh, he really wanted to have a huge military victory very early in life so that he could be just completely set up as a, as a military hero. And then that would, uh, that would compensate for all of the, uh, the, the shortcomings that he perceived that he had. And among them was his father passed away when he was around 12. His older brother, Lawrence, stepped in and started trying to help him, but then he passed away. Uh, Washington only had maybe two or three years of education, and his, step his mother kind of latched on to him as the man of the house and wouldn't let him travel or go to school or anything like that. Uh, in addition, his father's will passed all of the money to his older siblings and not to him and his mom. So despite what a lot of people think, Washington was not very well off, and he certainly wasn't very well educated. So he was in one big thrust trying to uh, make a big name for himself. And so once you start to understand these things, then it starts to, to make a little bit more sense. So coming out of ego uh, familiarization, we start to build a uh, self-assessment and personal action plan uh, for are we avoiding uh, understanding things whenever we, we get into some trigger type states? Or do we have some sort of plan and, and basically some sort of method, and there's a lot of them, and you know, it's up to you during the seminar to pick what you would like to do, um, but some sort of plan for self-monitoring those. So then the uh, next set of principles have to do with <clears throat> um, taking those loaded emotional reactions and then actually doing something with them. Uh, in, Lincoln, we uh, have Lincoln come out and he explains um, that he, how he familiarized with his ego. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Lincoln had two uh, complete nervous breakdowns that lasted over two weeks each. Uh, he was 26 and 34. And during that time, he spoke openly of ending in his own life. And thankfully, he didn't. Uh, he had a lot of ghosts in his past that haunted him that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, but fortunately, uh, Lincoln was a prolific letter writer, and we have a lot of his correspondences in terms of how he overcame his fears and insecurities. And then we move forward to more of a midpoint in Lincoln's life when he was running for senator against Douglas, and he was about to give the speech of his life, the House Divided Speech, which explained, explained that if slavery continued to spread which it was about to, that it was going to take down the entire country and democracy and all of this. And he's about to get up and give his speech the next day. And he gets word from the political bosses that he can't, he can't be so strong in that message. Well, you can imagine that his, uh, his, uh, his amygdala was running pretty strong, uh, but he was able to recognize that was shutting out his higher thinking. He was able to challenge the assumptions of his, of his subconscious things that were coming from his amygdala. And he was able to uh, get in control of that so that he could go ahead and hold his ground. And he gave his speech word for word. And number five there, shore up the frontal cortex with top-down responses. We literally have a script that Lincoln said that explained the type of thinking that was coming from his frontal cortex at that time, where he said, if you took a, a, a pen and erased everything I've accomplished in my whole life and left this one speech, I would be fine with that. 
that's a very powerful statement and it's the type of statement that it's hard you have to struggle through a lot of uneasy feelings but once you write that into your frontal cortex then it'll definitely answer uh, the amygdala's um, concerns and alarms so then uh, the last set of principles really is about being able to fully subordinate that amygdala, all of that energy uh, to the frontal cortex and to fluidly script uh, top-down responses. Uh, Churchill uh, had so much anxiety throughout his life that early on in his 30s, he just called it his black dog. And when he was going through a period of despondence, uh, he would just let people know that his black dog was visiting and he wasn't quite himself, and then he would be just so happy whenever he would say, Black Dog is going away. I don't know when he'll come back, but I'm glad he's gone now. Uh, but this guy, he had a lot of challenges during his adolescence. Uh, his father uh, lost his sanity uh, during one of the parliamentary speeches. Um, he was quite uh, not, not very well off in terms of the, the amount of money that they had. And... Um, so uh, also, um, most people don't realize that Churchill likely also had uh, somewhat of a learning disability. There were just certain things that he really struggled with. And unfortunately, his dad ridiculed him for it and just looked at it as a sign that he was lazy pretty much his whole life. But yet Churchill turned around, and because he was an emotionally accountable leader, he definitely, in, in the book and in the seminar, you will see how that he went through all of those displayed the behaviors that matched up with all of those principles, and he became so powerful in terms of being able to write and then to lead. He basically, um, as they say, mobilized the English language uh, to rally the world uh, to, to defeat uh, the worst uh, dictator that the world had ever seen. So we got some pretty good examples going on. Um, also, during these time frames, you'll probably, as I mentioned before, have a few other uh, guests pop in and, and kind of talk about some of their challenges that they overcame. And so those are the principles. And so a couple of things um, as we're wrapping up. Um, the This was presented at the Global Conference and it, immediate, it was immediately voted for an encore presentation. Uh, the book, bookstore sold out all three days. Fortunately, I've taken a lot more with me. And um, <clears throat> Northeastern University has incorporated this into their transformative leader curriculum. Um, the takeaways that you'll get from this are the ability to recognize when your amygdala is taking over and making you and your project vulnerable to organi organizational sabotage, techniques to use project anxiety as a source to shore up your frontal cortex so you can access your full emotional intellect, and a new vocabulary to provide to your project team to transform organizational resistance and project anxiety into emotional intellect and stellar project performance. So I'll go ahead and wrap just by giving some of the, the intro, some of the feedback that we got. Um, obviously, uh, very engaging. Um, kind of hinted here at some theater that we use that people really, really like uh, to bring to life the examples. A um, lot of lot of preparation has gone into this. To make it very easy for you to just pick up and be bored with, you'll be able to start practicing these things right away. And um, <clears throat> then finally, basically being able to tie these historical leaders and their anxieties back to the anxieties that we have as project leaders, uh, and then provide tools to really leverage that. A uh, lot of great feedback from the audience attendees of both sessions saying that they really appreciated that. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I was just making some notes here while you were speaking, and uh, uh, you mentioned an awful lot about uh, the brain and, and, and how we use it. And uh, what I, I kept thinking about was uh, you, uh, one of the messages that I got out of this was that we have to think with agility. And uh, that was kind of uh, sort of like um, reading between the lines when you were talking about uh, ego rescripting. Uh, you also mentioned the emotional accountable leader. I, I think we probably got a lot of those in the world today, and uh, project managers should, uh, I guess, really spend a lot more time understanding emotional intelligence. You know how their behaviors affect 
their their work and how they work and and how those behaviors affect other people, and including how other people behave too. So, um, and and one other thing that's that's really a very popular subject today, and I know that there's a conference and I don't know the title of the conference, but it has an awful lot to do with the transformative leadership which has become kind of a, uh, a, a popular topic amongst many uh, PMI professional development days and other programs. And also congratulations on the fact that you were able to uh, present something that became an Encore presentation during a PMI World Congress. So um, thank you for your input. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move right on to our final speaker, uh, Tim Rennie. So, so Tim, I'm going to actually uh, promote you right to presenter at this point in time. Uh, you should see a uh, screen, a note on your screen that says uh, share your screen. And if you wouldn't mind doing so, and uh, we'll move right on into your presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tim Rennie. All right, thank you, Frank. This is Tim. Can you hear me? Hello? I'll just go. Yes. Um, so, okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, um, you know, I've had my, my PMP since 2005. My PM experience is primarily in the energy facility uh, engineer procure construct space as well as technology solutions for the space and techni technical consulting in the pipeline market. So the topic I've, I've got for the, for the seminar, um, it'll be a presentation on something that I, that I just recently completed with a, a current employer to prepare a fit for purpose PM methodology. Uh, and it's really in the technical consulting world. Um, during the initial stages of, of this initiative, it was pretty evident um, as you'll see, as we go, said I had to take a risk-based approach, so it it, it kind of blends in with some of the things you already heard about, and I think uh, you know you'll find this to be worthwhile sessions. So I, just a little more on myself. So I, I you know I got into project management um, as part of an advanced degree program back in 1982. So the, that that kind of gives me a date. Um, everybody says, oh okay. You know, 35 years ago, there wasn't a PMP credential, there wasn't a PMBOK guide, um, and you know, PMI was still working to establish what it was they wanted to promote. Uh, one thing we should all be thankful for was the, the collective vision that, at that time um, that, that that discipline of project management would someday become an actual profession. So, um, but in that degree program, I actually we studied out of the first edition of Kersner's. Project Management for Executives as a textbook, and if you've ever seen that, it's, it's I believe it's still thicker than even the, the edition six of the PMBOK guide. Um, but when I go back and leaf through the book, it's it's kind of comforting to see that a lot of what 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 was written at that time, 35 years ago, is still still core of the foundation of what we do as project managers. It's evolved a lot, right? We've got agile now is taking over uh, in a, in a number of different applications. But the fundamentals are all still there. So, um, you know, I got my start in the project management business. Um, you know, really around the, the thesis for that that degree program. So it was the project management for the implementation of 3D plant design for uh, a large chemical company. So what what happened here? Um, you know, my current role is a private equity-backed pipeline services consulting firm. Uh, not too long after I joined, had a conversation with a with one of the board members who was actually the, the original founder. Um, and he was kind of lamenting that that he saw a burgeoning PM process getting rolled into the organization that uh, was taking away from the entrepreneurial foundation of the business, and you know, the, basically what helped him serve up. Uh, the success in a, in a very successful sale to the, to the private equity partners. And, you know, what I have at the top of the slide was literally, I took out some of the color. Um, you know, he asked me, he says, you know, pretty much told me, he says, I need to prepare a simple, effective PM process that anyone can use. And don't tell me to go read the PEMDOT guide. So somebody made that, made that mistake somewhere along the way prior to me. 
So when I, when I sat down and talked with him more about it, you know, so the basic requirements I got out of him, you know, again, the, the, the focus was to, was business performance. Uh, and we had to maximize the results on those, on the projects that the company does. Um, there were some project failures. I think everybody's been involved with some of those. So we had to, um, do enough to try to increase the likelihood of project success. He wanted to make sure we minimize the cost of project management. It was, it was his belief that it was actually causing a, uh, causing the company a little to lose some of the project proposals to competition. And he wanted a simplified methodology from proposal to close out. And here's the clincher. He wanted anyone to be able to manage a project. So and we all, I think we've, we've probably been in various stages of this in our careers. And, um, you know, it was it was kind of shocking to to go through some of this with him, but but that's where he was. And you know, he's the original founder, is board member, and um, we you know you can't just dismiss what he what he wanted. So in other words, when you when you dig into the PMBOK, you know, you, you, we've got this nice process group interaction chart, and it's been there for a long time. Um, and it really really at a high level says, you know, here's the level of effort you need in each of the various phases of a project, um, and they all provide a lot of value. I think we all know that. But what he wanted was this. Uh, you know, he really just wanted anybody to be able to do this. And, you know, in an entrepreneurial world, that just spells risk. And, you know, we already had a little bit of discussion on risk, and it spells a lot of it. Um, and that's what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs do. They, they take risk and... Um, you know, they, they hit one every once in a while, and it, it pays off handsomely for them. But this is a company where projects are in the range of 5000 to $5 million in contract value. 90% of them are under a quarter million dollars. And they're all technical in nature. Um, and we're, you know, we're only there to help our customers get things done that either they can't do or they're being pushed by the regulators to get done. And... Um, you know, so you take a five thousand dollar project. There's you're talking thirty five to fifty hours worth of work. You can't do all the project management processes on that, and maybe you don't need to. Um, even on a a two hundred thousand dollar project, you know, you might have twelve hundred hours. So there's there's just not a lot of time to spend on all the traditional things. Um, so again, it spells out risk. And it spells a lot of it. And and after some conversations with uh, with with some of the, the stakeholders in the in the organization, so we had the functional leaders, we had some uh, operational leaders, as well as the salespeople. Um, you know, it was what they needed. You know, and how do we manage the risk? Uh, it beca became pretty evident that there was one particular um, ITTO in the PMBOK that we actually could apply here, and uh, so that's that's how I took the group through this. Um, and, and it really was, it turned out to be fairly simple. Um, and, but the trick that we came up with was to produce a, a risk classification decision process that allowed us to determine right away, um, what we're able to do. And, um, uh, from that, from that forward, um uh, you know we came up with this with this three class process and 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 you know the end result um it it, it it's pretty simple to use every opportunity um and it's applied when the salespeople say okay this is a qualified opportunity we're going to chase this and it's based on some business elements of of that opportunity and you don't know a lot of detail at that point so it's got to be it's, it's fairly high high level business aspects that we're that we're addressing but that what we came up with was a series of proposals templates to use uh, a re review and approval um, process during the proposal stage based on the risk class you know the, what you don't want is a um, a doer seller who who uh, runs you know thirty thousand dollar projects fifty thousand dollar projects you know committing the company to you know a, a multi million dollar deal with a, a new customer with contract terms that we've not agreed to in the in the past 
or even doing uh, some work that's not down the fairway. So, you know, the whole, the whole idea is, is to measure, you know, what are the things that caused projects to crater in the past? What are the things that we struggle with in the past? And they were kind of enlightening as we went through that process. So when they're awarded, uh, the other, some of the other things we came up with were some PEP templates that were really based on the risk class. So, um, you know, for example, on the low, the class C risk, we've it's a, it's literally a one-page uh, PEP. Uh, you know, it's something we'll we'll dive into. You know, how we arrived at what it is that that needed to be on there, and that's it. So it's fill in the blank, literally, um, all the way up to a, some of the more classical. PEPs that you would use on a high-risk project, um, and it really, you know, the, the, and, it, and it drove us to a point of, okay, well, so how do we take care of some of the other knowledge areas, you know, in the reporting, controls, reviews, communications, and 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 it, and it helped drive us to standardize some of these things. So, the the one thing that, um, that I think surprised all of us when we got through this was it. it it really did become more of a fit for purpose methodology. And it it freed, it, it, it brought back some of the entrepreneurial platform to the company. Uh, it allowed the, the strong doer sellers to go out and exercise, um, you know, what they do best and, and nobody got in the way uh, versus, uh, you know, when, it, when a sales guy brings in something he thinks the company can do and, you know, it, it's the next big fish that, that he's, we're gonna go kill that whale. Um, you know, what's it going to take to pull it off? We've never done it before. Uh, who do we have that can even run this project and so forth? And where do we get the resources? So it, it kind of drove us in, into a, a fit for purpose based on the size of the opportunity. And so it really, um, it's, it, it, it's a pretty novel idea. I think what, what we were able to accomplish there, um, it's working right now. Uh, the board, the, the board member, the founder is, is is you know allow us the time here to to prove it out um so um you know we'll go through a lot of things here i hope to have a discussion on some of the some of the prior things people have run into because you know in my career i've i've done help develop a variety of methodologies one was for a uh a work sharing program a major e and c um globally that that they were able that they still use today, and this was uh, 15 years ago. Um, that they share four million, four plus million hours a year of engineering work between uh, 150 offices around the world. So uh, the other thing um, was revamp of a, a whole project delivery process in the midstream space, and uh, I you know, got through with that about six years ago, and turn that whole business around for that company as a result because there, there was a whole portfolio of projects that were not performing well and they were going to stop doing those projects if um, we didn't have a way out of that, a way to help ensure that we were going to deliver some of the money that was promised at the end of the day on those projects. So what I hope, uh, you know, is, is, is a topic here that, that piques your interest. I think we'll be able to tie into some of the other topics um, nicely as we go through this and hope to see you on board. So, uh, Frank, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Um, yeah, again, uh, making notes on, on the session. Um, uh, one of the things that I came up with, and people had said this before, and you might agree, is that risk management is project management. And yep. if you really think about it, Anything and everything that we do and the projects that we work on uh, is associated with risk, whether it's people, machinery, tools, equipment, or anything. Uh, the other thing that I found, uh, and you probably found it also, because of the, the model that you provided, uh, the three-class uh, risk model, is that we really need to keep risk management simple for the people that are on the teams, that to inundate them with the risk theory is probably not the right approach. It, it's to utilize their knowledge uh, about the project and what they have experienced in the past to help to uh, minimize or even prevent, uh, you know, unfortunate things from occurring in the future. And of course, uh, your model em emphasizes how to prioritize risks, really pretty important in terms of um, the appropriate resource uh, allocations. So um, the, the key point to, to take on the way of this, at least for me, was risk management is an, a, an essential part of any project. Uh, it should be discussed right up in the beginning. But also uh, keep it uh, simple enough 
uh, that people are going to see that it is truly, truly a benefit for any project, whether it's a large one or small one. I think you mentioned 5,000 to 5, 5 million in terms of the range of projects. But um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things that I found, and maybe you can comment real quick before we close out, is um, many companies do not seem, even though we talk about risk an awful lot, don't seem to have a very strong uh, uh, risk practice or approach. Uh, and we need to address that. Any comments on, on, on getting people to, to really pay attention to risk management? Yeah, that's a good question, Frank. Um, I, I run into that a lot everywhere we go. Um, in the businesses I'm with, when I talk to customers, uh, when I'm out um, you know, cleaning up a project, um, helping clean up a project, helping restore a relationship, you, know, you look back and you say, wow, there were some pretty obvious risks here that we either ignored and knew, or um, even worse, we didn't know, and we, so we didn't know they needed needed more attention than they got. And it it's not so much that people don't understand risk as, as much as there's there's no way to facilitate a group of people through through the risk and really boil it down. Um, uh, it's real easy for a group to get, you know, I'll call it wrapped around the crank on on developing a risk model and, and pursuing and, and trying to prepare a risk management plan on a project, especially a large project. And uh, in the EPC space, you know, when you get on some of these mega projects, the, you, know, you, you can spend thousands of hours uh, for the projects over just doing the risk management planning from, from proposal on through closeout. And um, unless you have a way to, to boil that down, a way to, to get people focused on what's really going to impact the project, um, what are you willing to accept and why, versus what do you got to get really active on and, and spend some resources to make sure you don't get caught up in. Um, that That's that's the trick. So. Okay, yeah, and, and I think that uh, during the, the, uh, the cruise, there'll be a lot more... Um, <clears throat> information and more questions regarding uh, you know how how we can provide a, a risk management strategy you know that is really something that people are going to buy into so I'm looking forward to your your presentation uh, I, I, I just as, as we close out for those of you that are online here um, <clears throat> normally we are we run these webinars for about one hour we're, we're a little bit over but we had four speakers on so i'm adjusting the uh, pdu to 1.5 pdus uh 0.5 technical 0.5 leadership and 0.5 uh, st strategy so that you can uh, apply that to your uh profile especially those of you that are looking for um pdus to help you or requalify for your pmp or uh, other pmi credentials so so with that I'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, joining the session. Thank these speakers for their time. And uh, hopefully we've convinced you that the seminars at CU is going to be a great program, not only from a uh, <clears throat> an educational perspective, but it's going to be vacation. As Elena had mentioned uh, earlier today, that uh, you'll, you'll get a chance to learn, you'll get a chance to relax. Uh, what better way to um, to gain PDUs, learn something, but to, to be in a cruise that you're going to be in the sun, uh, you'll have an opportunity to do some some visiting, networking, and just enjoy yourself. So um, Sherry at HoustonTravelZone.com is the person to contact for registration information. Uh, AJ Collier is the president of the Clear Lake Galveston chapter, uh, and we'll be sending out flyers and information about the webinar. And we invite any of your feedback also regarding this particular session. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for joining. And uh, this se session has been recorded. And uh, we'll make that available probably in the next uh, day or two. And we'll get that information out to all of you that registered and all of you that attended. And hopefully you'll pass this information on to other people. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, sign off from, from New York City where the temperature is 11 degrees. And uh, the cruise uh, temperature, when, when, when you get out there in the Gulf of Mexico, definitely should be in the 80s and uh, uh, even up to, to the 90s. And we'll have some sun and some fun and some good times and also quite a bit of networking and just a sharing of information. So thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Uh, before we close out, I'll, I'll leave the line open for just a few minutes in case anybody has any comments or questions that they would like to discuss. And uh, with that, again, I say thank you very much and thank you to all of the speakers.
for being part of today's webinar. Okay, I don't see that there, we have any questions other than uh, one person said, hey, I'm thinking about taking the cruise, which is what we like to hear. So uh, Alan, Alina, Joseph, and, and Tim, thank you very much. And uh, we'll make sure that you get a copy of the uh, recording of the session. And uh, we really appreciate your time uh, sharing your information with our uh, audience. Okay, take care, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Frank. Have a great day. Bye, guys. Take care.